people who, who say we need gun control, I'm not gonna call them idiots, but they're, they're idiots, you know. If you go down because you um, let people take sick days, then it's a, that's a noble way to fall. For the first time in seven years, the Syrian government says it has full control of Damascus. It's a major step toward Bashar al-Assad regaining control of the entire country. The U.S. has threatened Iran with what it's calling the strongest sanctions in history. Iran will be forced to make a choice. Either fight to keep its economy off life support at home, or keep squandering precious wealth on fights abroad. But Iran can avoid the sanctions. All it has to do is comply with 12 demands laid out by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, including ending support for Hezbollah and Hamas, withdrawing forces from Syria, and stopping uranium enrichment. Reports of the death of Google's unofficial motto, don't be evil, are an exaggeration. While the company did delete a paragraph about the phrase from its code of conduct, the wording still exists. It's just been demoted. Paraguay has moved its embassy to Jerusalem, joining Guatemala in following in the U.S.'s footsteps. We have no better friends than you. Thank you, Horacio. Thank you, Paraguay. Thank you. China wants to become the first country to reach the far side of the moon. And now it's one step closer after launching a relay satellite that will enable communication between Earth and a Chinese lunar probe launching later this year. My name is Wesley Hill. I'm a senior at Santa Fe High School, um, where today a very, very tragic event happened where a active shooter came in the school and shot many people in the school. There were 10 dead and 10 injured. I'm in the AV club and Vice asked me to show you the impact it had on our school and our town. The first thing I thought about when I woke up is, is other families are waking up or haven't been to sleep yet because knowing that their child or uh, sister, brother, niece, nephew, grandchild isn't waking up with them, isn't eating breakfast with them, um, isn't being loud and accidentally waking them up, um, you know, thinking that I'm lucky to be alive today. Um, I'm lucky to, to be able to see another day. When I heard it was in the art room, I was freaking out because it was my brother's class. I didn't know if he was okay or anything. I tried calling him and kept calling him, calling him, he didn't answer. So I was really scared for him. He made it out though, he's all right. After I graduated, you know, I just wanted to leave, you know, visit places, see places. It's such a small town, you know, you want to get out of it, you want to go explore. But now I kind of just want to stay by my family for a while. I felt really, I guess, I felt really scared, even though I knew you were okay, because I knew that you were in a building where people had died. So I can only imagine, like, for you, what that must have been like. Walking out and seeing people that you've known since kindergarten panicked and in danger, and all you did was wake up and go to school that day. I wanna know, were you scared? Did you know what was happening? Of course I was scared. When it first happened, I knew it happened. Um, I was sitting in class. It's probably about 7.30, school starts at 7.10. Um, I was sitting in class and there were kids running down the hall. What did you think at that point? I didn't know. I thought it was just kids being kids running down last the hall. Last day of school, kind of, or last yeah. week of school kind of thing? And, um... Was anybody screaming? Yeah, but it was, I mean... Still there's, playful? There's kids sounding? always yeah. loud in the hall. And, um, about 20 seconds later, a, uh, a teacher comes in and her comes running by. There's a dude with the gun. There's a dude with the gun. He has a shotgun. He has a shotgun. And he kept running, and um, 
So then we got in sheltered in place like we were supposed to. I know there's a lot of kids and a lot of parents saying that they're gonna be unenrolling their kid from that school to- And that's so sad. You can't ask them to go back. What is your solution to stopping it? On the teachers. It doesn't have to be every single teacher in every single classroom. It doesn't. But you know, if we're gonna ask these teachers, and we do on a daily basis, and it's really sad to parent our children, okay? Then we need to ask them to protect the same children. Did you think that you were in danger? What did you think? Did you think about us? You uh, just thought no, about mom? I, I really didn't. I thought about today is going to be the last day that I'll be alive. Like, I didn't know what to think. I am very grateful that you are not one of those people. I think that definitely needs to be said. And my heart does go out to the people that that did lose a loved one. But at the same time, every parent in that school, every brother and sister of somebody in that school knows what I mean when I say hearing your voice was one of the greatest things I've ever heard. I love you. Thank you, too. That's, I mean, we don't need gun control. What we need is we need somebody to do better background checks on the people who are buying the guns. Do maybe do some mental stable health checks or something. But people who say we need gun control, people who say we need gun control are that I'm not going to call them idiots, but they're, they're idiots. You know, like if I put a gun right here, that gun is not going to go off and go on a mass killing spree. Now, if I pick that gun up, I'm not saying I'm not going to, but if I pick that gun up and I point it at you and I shoot it, the gun didn't shoot you. I shot you because I pulled the trigger. The first person that reached out to me when they saw that I was on the news was March for Our Lives Houston. I straight up told them right then and there that they're reaching out to the wrong people. I said, uh, you're, you're, this is Santa Fe, this is in the city. I said, this is a, a small town, country town. I said, you're not gonna take our guns away. We're a tight knit com community. Around, uh, mostly everybody here hunts, shoot, they, you know, they do some kind of something with guns. And if you take away, you take that away, what are we gonna do? Did you know him? Uh, when I was a sophomore, him and I were friends in the art class. And we talked like almost every day during my sophomore year. But after I became a junior, we just stopped talking. Would you have ever seen this happening from him? I guess if I had to guess who would do it, it'd be him because he always had the trench coat, the big combat boots. He was a total loner. Everyone just had that feeling from him. I was shocked when I heard about the Parkland one, and I'm shocked now that it's me. I can't believe that it's already, you know, been about two days since it happened. It feels like it literally just happened, like, this morning. It's crazy how yeah. last weekend was prom, mm -hmm. and everybody was excited, and everybody was in a joyful mood. And now you go out in the community, and it's... Something completely different. I wish you could just experience prom again and be happy. I yeah. Mean, I mean, I guess you could say go back in time to last Friday and, and change everything. I would honestly give everything I could to to go back to school today and know that those kids are still in school. Yeah, and they're still doing okay. You know, that Dimitri's doing okay um, and that all the kids are still doing okay and that Dimitri would have talked to somebody instead of doing what he did. Doing what he did. Nicolas Maduro won a second term in office yesterday with voter turnout as low as 32%. It's not just that Venezuelans didn't vote, it's that Venezuelans increasingly aren't in Venezuela at all. Since 2014, about 1.5 million people have packed up and gone to live elsewhere. 5,000 more people are making that decision every single day.
esto en mi familia. De re, estas son las personas pues, que más me afecta dejar acá. Decidí retirarme porque no, el dinero no, no alcanzaba para nada. Ya iba a cumplir tres años de graduada y sentía que no había construido nada durante ese tiempo. O sea, acá no hay ningún lugar en donde te pueda decir que como bienalista pudiera ganar ni siquiera en una empresa transnacional. Lo máximo que paga una empresa transnacional son 20 millones. Cuando acá ya vale, o sea, un aceite de 2 millones. Creo que no hay una familia en donde uno de sus integrantes no esté fuera del país. Es la única forma en que quizás uno pueda alimentarse bien en que alguien que esté en otro lugar no envíe dinero. A partir de que tomó el mandato del presidente de Maduro, o sea, ahí hubo como un colapso de todo, medicamentos, alimentos, todo fue algo muy, muy rápido. La harina pan, o sea, unas colas enormes, más de 200 personas para comprar una harina. Tienes que irte incluso el día anterior a dejar la cédula para poder comprar el día siguiente. Para eso es que uno se va, pues, para tratar de ayudar a su familia al que queda acá. O sea, no que no estén pasando lo que uno pasó. Me voy con mi mejor amiga, me voy con Eliana. Pues ella incluso tenía ya todos sus documentos arreglados y pues no se había ido para no irse con alguien que no fuera de confianza. Y bueno, yo decidí irme y nos, des nos vamos juntas ahora. En los hospitales no hay nada. Un día aquí lo pasé con mi sobrina. Le dio una, como una gastritis. Era una clínica privada y aún con todo eso no había medicamento para colocarle a la niña. ¿Esto? Ay, tú, mi abuelo y mi abuela. Está pequeño. Ay, sí. Es tu sobrina, ves que esa bebé está ahí con un dolor, no tienes nada para darle. Y dije, esto es ya lo último y me voy. Eh, conocí una página por medio de un amigo eh, que se ganaba en dólares trabajando por internet. Yo llevo dos dólares con 77. Nah. ¿Qué? ¿Muy poquito? ¿Mucho? Al día tú vas a hacer lo que le dediques, pero trabajando el día se pueden obtener hasta 2 y 3 dólares diarios trabajando bien, todo el día. En comparación al sueldo que, te, que tenía trabajando en una empresa y lo que estaba haciendo era súper mejor trabajar en mi casa, sentada en la computadora porque ganaba el doble, casi más el doble de lo que está ganando en una empresa. Uno siempre quiso tener una estabilidad, ayudar a su familia. Yo de mi parte, por ejemplo, mis padres son muy humildes. Entonces, uno ve tantos sacrificios que ellos hicieron y uno lo que desea es ayudarlo. Eso no quisiera yo como padre, que, que se me fuera mi hija. Es tremendo. ¿eh? Hola familia, eh, voy saliendo de Guanare, me estoy escribiendo por el grupo para que estén pendientes, los quiero muchísimo, yo me voy pero me los llevo a todito en mi corazón, cuídense mucho. Salimos de Guanare hasta San Antonio, Cúcuta, ahí cruzamos, agarramos un bus hasta Cali, de Cali a Rumichaca, 
y de Rumichaca salimos directo hasta Quito y de Quito Guayaquil y de Guayaquil hacia la frontera son aproximadamente ocho días de viaje. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿usted? ¿Cuál es tu último destino? Perú. Perú. ¿Profesión, por favor? Pianalista. Sí, muy bien, hasta luego. Gracias. Hola, mami, bendición, ¿cómo estás? Eh, estamos acá ya en Cúcuta. Y bueno, llegamos temprano, a las 4 sale el bus hacia Cali. Y de ahí espero poderte escribir. Siempre deseé conocer unos países de visita, pero nunca imaginé irme a otro país y sé que todos los días en Colombia. Pues fue por un futuro mejor. Yo pienso regresar, o sea, lo que más deseo es envejecer junto a mi familia. O sea, es algo que lo quiero así, pues, y voy a trabajar para eso. The Farm Bill is usually bland and uncontroversial. It provides funding for agriculture programs and for food assistance. Usually, everyone in Congress votes for it. Not this time. On Friday, the Farm Bill collapsed under bipartisan opposition for reasons that have very little to do with farming. This latest dumpster fire in Washington is another reminder that a lot of the time the thing that Congress is officially debating, in this case farm policy, is not what it's actually debating. So conservative House Republicans helped torpedo the Farm Bill on Friday as a protest for not getting something totally unrelated, a vote on a hardline immigration proposal first. Meanwhile, Democrats had their own reason for opposing the bill because it includes stricter work requirements on food stamps, officially called the Supplemental Nutrition Aid Program, or SNAP. The government already requires adults between 18 and 49 who aren't disabled and don't have kids to work at least 20 hours per week in order to get food stamps for more than three months. The new bill would shorten that window to one month and would require people to prove their job status every month or risk losing benefits for a full year. Analysts say those changes could end up kicking millions of people off the rolls. I spoke to Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, a Delaware Democrat who implemented the state's job training and SNAP programs as Delaware's Deputy Secretary for Health and Social Services. She said that even if job training requirements are a good idea, this bill doesn't do them correctly. A good training program could cost you anywhere from maybe $3,500 a year to up to $14,000. This program basically allocates about $30 per person per month. That's not enough, it's insufficient. The bigger problem is that by clamping down on SNAP, the bill goes after a key benefit for low-income people, while at the same time, it expands one for corporations. The bill would actually eliminate income caps on farm subsidy programs for pass-through entities, like LLCs, meaning that big corporate farms could get government money even if they already make a lot. For Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, that's a non-starter, in large part because she's been on food stamps herself. I guess that's why this gets personal for me, because for that kid, you know, that gets the support of some food on the table, that allows them to go to school and to learn. I can't learn if I'm hungry. John Culberson in the 7th Congressional District. When you ask Laura Moser what she stands for, you get a well-worn litany of progressive policy goals. I believe in Medicare for all. I believe it's okay to talk about gun reform the day after a mass shooting. I believe that climate change is not a controversial topic. But Moser was already internet famous. In 2015, her then two-year-old threw a tantrum at the White House. The photo went viral. As a candidate, Moser's taking a big bet on a new kind of campaign one that offers staffers something they're not used to, a shred of dignity. We still are working seven days a week, 
Um, we do get a morning a week off. It is a huge help for morale. It's a huge help for just not being like the level of exhausted that we usually are. So it's a six and a half day week. Yeah. You work. Yeah, yeah. With your, this, 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 this is the cushy campaign game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The line on campaign work is that it has to suck. Some staffers this year are demanding it suck just a little less. This is one of 15 campaigns operating under a union contract negotiated by a new group called the Campaign Workers Guild. Salaried guild employees get a base pay of $3,000 a month. Hourly employees get $15 an hour. There's a healthcare stipend so staff can buy insurance and a promise to pay for gas and other reimbursements. All of you people here assembled who've worked so hard for this campaign know it's not easy. Campaign life doesn't have these guarantees built in. It's kind of lawless. And that's more than just a money problem. There's no sexual harassment training at all, and there's absolutely no procedure in place. So you just sort of wait, and you talk to some of your other women coworkers about it, and commiserate, and drink a few beers that night, and then go to work the next day. Harassment is a very real problem on campaigns. Hillary's campaign had allegations. So did Bernie's. There have even been allegations of candidates harassing their own campaign staff. Guild union contracts include an anonymous harassment reporting process. You know, like a real workplace. Why do campaign workers not have this stuff already? Because resources are so finite. Every dollar spent on something other than winning votes is a dollar wasted. So staff are asked to buy into a workplace that's more cult than corporate. To get the win, you must suffer. You're trying to make democracy better, but you're working in a horrible dictatorship. <laughs> can progressives have success if they change that model? Can progressives have success if they don't change that model? I'd say would be the better question. Times are changing. We're much more aware of, like with the Me Too movement, some of the things that have been going on in workplaces that just aren't acceptable anymore. I don't think that, especially now with this movement kind of taking off and more and more campaigns unionizing, I think that a campaign that's refusing to unionize I don't know how they're going to succeed against candidates that are sort of like taking that extra step and making sure that they're practicing what they preach. The campaign manager told us she has had to move precious dollars around to cover the cost of union benefits. She called the amount trivial, but other campaigns wouldn't take this chance. More money for campaign staff means less money for campaign ads. Moser is okay with that. We've seen in multiple elections that the campaigns who spend the most on television, for example, often are not the ones who emerge victorious. And so I think having um, staffers who are invested in your campaign and who are being treated um, humanely, I don't see the risk there. And if, if you go down because you um, let people take sick days, then that's fine. That's a, that's a noble way to fall. Hey, my name's Courtney Barnett, and today we're going to be talking about City Looks Pretty from my album, Tell Me How You Really Feel. Everyone's waiting when you get back home. They don't know where you've been, why you gone so long. City Looks Pretty, I started writing when I was in my early 20s, really depressed and wouldn't leave my room. The city takes pity on your injured soul And heavenly prose ain't enough good to fill that hole I love that line. I think that I don't really understand it still. <laughs> the bass line, it kind of just rolls and drones throughout the whole song, like a constant movement of a city. Sometimes I get mad The drums in the chorus, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick that bit. And that was the one tiny thing that broke up the constant kind of driving. They're all quite simple and consistent, so they create foreboding, like when is something gonna happen? <laughs> A lot of my discussions were just to play weirder, making lots of happy, melodic accidents in the process. Yeah. 
the change in the song from the up tempo to the kind of that outro, it kind of turned into like a real ballad, slowing down and, and seeing what's around you in contrast to that speedy, letting everything rush past you. The kind of journey of the whole song, it seemed kind of ridiculous in a good way.